so uh, welcome to another epispo- episode of gp speaks and today we have a cinematographer who has done series called jamtara who has shot a movie called cargo and does many uh, commercials for uh, commercials and movies and many other things and many more things coming up so uh, here hi hi kaushal hi. how are you hi 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 how are you yeah. yeah so uh, so how how did you became cinematographer like oh, i think our audience would be very curious to know about how did you became a uh, cinematographer so i was actually doing my engineering and uh, i never really had an inclination to film before but i was around 18 years old when uh, i wanted to sort of move away from engineering i was not really enjoying it very much i was looking for something more artistic in a way to sort of uh, you know something hands on not really uh, something related to a lot of technicals uh, but i didn't know what i wanted to do so uh, i started googling things and i was looking at animation this and that basically i just wanted like a window to like sort of escape engineering at that time i don't know why i was in that state but i was um and uh, once i think someone had mentioned that there's a summer course and uh, in pune and i'm from bombay that uh, you should just go in the break time and just try it out just cuz uh, you have nothing to do it's like an extra curricular thing and i said okay fine what's it and uh, that guy mentioned that it's cinematography i said what is cinematography i didn't know about it and i looked it up i read about it seemed interesting i thought okay i'll just go because i anyway want to just take a break from bombay and my first semester after engineering and i went not expecting anything and there was a short course in pune that i did uh, there was a brilliant teacher his name is as kanal uh he taught us there and uh, for some reason like i felt like i took on to it naturally you know like i could do things uh, that a lot of people who, who were doing it for years and studying it for years were finding it difficult to do and uh, i had an act for like operating a camera and this and that i never done photography before that i was 18 years old so you know there was no such uh, you know a lot of people talk about like yeah. oh they started taking things when they were 5 years old and they used to see life and you know that kind of thing with me just started accidentally i really enjoyed the three weeks there and uh, i thought like okay man this is something that i like doing but i don't know if i want to do it for life but at least i can tell my parents that maybe this is something i want to do and uh, take a break from engineering so i came back and i told my parents that i want to be a cinematographer and they were like laughing at me they were like just continue your semester you know i think you're just saying this because maybe you flunk your uh, first semester or something they didn't believe me but when the results came out i had actually cleared uh, everything and uh, i had actually topped my class in mechanical engineering so they kind of started believing that okay fine this guy is not really just escaping uh so i knew someone who knew someone who was like a cinematographer and he was going in the film industry with this slow motion camera it was very new at that time yeah. it's called the phantom so i wanted to intern so i went and i just told them that this is what i want to do this and that uh, so for th- uh, four or five months i did like a free internship where i was learning the way this new camera works and that new camera was like a really hot thing right at, at that point because not a lot of people in india had it so we were basically going from one shoot to the other so like i was on a rockstar set for example to like a lot of like dam maro dam was another film i think i was on and there were a lot of these films where there were like these slow motion shots required so i was hopping basically and i was just an intern i was not doing much you know i was just learning picking up things i did that for like 6 7 months and uh, my parents slowly believed that okay fine like he is putting in the effort and he is learning so maybe he needs the academic thing too so i uh, put myself into whistling was international it's a film school in bombay um, i got in because i was like 19 at that point so fti was out of question because it was only after you graduate and things like that so i um i i got there and i studied uh, for a couple of years so i studied cinematography there and i got out when i was like 20 21 and since then it's just been a journey of like figuring out how to get the kind of work you want and things like that wow that's really interesting so as you mentioned like you were learning on the set and then you did your graduation so is right. there any like uh, like few things that you would like to mention which a good cinematographer must have i think uh, see a cinematographer is like a right balance between something that's very creative and still very technical you're you're basically deciding the visuals of a film you know according to what's written 
so uh, you have to collaborate with the director and uh, figure out the right things but you also have to technically make sure that things are worked out uh, and it's a constant learning process it's not like you do just a course and that's it you know i mean i think it's in every field like you are certified to do it but it's a constant state of learning it's like an infinite state of learning till till the end you know so yeah. uh, as long as you're you have the hunger to do it and you have the knack of balancing creative with technical uh, i think you you could handle it well uh uh-huh. yeah yeah i completely agree like every every field you have to keep on learning like even in cinematography uh, the uh, like the era shifted from the reel to digital so like uh, how how you thought like when you saw the shift what were your points and what you thought about the shift from reel to digital see when i started shooting uh, right now i'm like 27 so when i started shooting which is like around 6 7 years ago the shift was already happening you know so film was out film was just there in our film schools to learn but the the, the digital age had already taken over so i mean i'm completely for technology and what it does to you and things like that but i'm also for what an older technology in puts in you which is basic principle you know when you have lesser means to do something figure out more ways you use your mind more and the newer technology makes you use your mind a little lesser so i think if you keep the same application that was before and use that application to achieve things now it will really be more helpful so the principles of the past but the choices of the future you know yeah. so i mean i'm definitely not against digital technology but i really feel like there is a little bit there's a charm to what film does for example you know someone like christopher nolan still shoots film so there is a reason why they do that they still shoot in the the way things are i mean yes most of the world has taken to digital but i feel most of the learning still happens on film because that's the best way to learn um principles of like cinematography photography uh that kind of thing and it's it's like at the end of the day like for example if you want to learn how to paint you will not learn it on like an app on the laptop you have to take the brush you need the paper so you need the analog things that push your mind to think and that's what older technology does and that's why it's so important still you know so like let's come to uh, in detail about your work life so like may, uh, may our audience know like what exactly your typical week looks like uh so there is nothing like a set rule in terms of the timelines of work in our field yeah. you know so for example um i pick up this project and i have a meeting with the director of jamtara and i meet him and uh everything goes well we get along and i really like the story i want to be a part of it so i sign up for that project now that film was that was at least an 8 month commitment okay so first you go to the town itself you look at the locations you recce the locations you go there you come back you decide where you want to shoot so you go find the locations so we cheated jharkhand and maharashtra so we went to maharashtra we looked at small villages we combined that we decided this is where we want to shoot then you have to go out and decide what time you want to shoot what that kind of thing so all that is called location scouting and uh, tech prep and all of that and then the the, the shooting actually starts So literally there are no timelines so you basically when you're doing scouts you have to basically go out whenever you want whenever that location is supposed to be looked at for example if i'm shooting in a forest and i want to shoot at night so there is no point in going there in the daytime and looking at the sunlight coming in so i need to go there and figure out how i want to create the night and stuff like that a general shooting day is usually around 12 to 14 hours and when you're shooting like something like jamtara or a feature film you do that for at least 60 to 70 days back to back with maybe like a days break every 8 9 days you know so uh, that's when it's when i'm shooting that's the normal day and that should the, there are like shifts in our field you know so you shoot 7 to 7 which is 7 am to 7 pm 9 am to 9 pm 2 pm to 2 am 7 pm to 7 am now it depends on what kind of scene you have whether it's a night time scene whether it's a day time scene whatever is convenient that's usually the working day looks like you have recently done jamtara and it got released and it got so much love on netflix so uh, may i know what are the challenges you faced while shooting jamtara see jamtara again uh, we when i read the script um, jamtara is in jamtara jamtara is a small district in jharkhand and this is where all the cyber crime happens and uh, in the district there is a small village called karamtan 
it's a very small village where people live in like mud houses thatch houses there are some small buildings here and there it's a very small town so uh, we had to create that kind of a vibe um but we cannot afford to go and shoot there because it's not very safe and also like you don't get the best crew in jharkhand you know jharkhand doesn't have like a film thing going even if it yeah. has it might not be that elaborate like in bombay so we were very clear that we want to shoot somewhere in maharashtra so now the job of you know get that texture here so we basically went to jamtara we spent some time there we lived there for like 2 weeks uh we lived in uh, karamtand we found out about what's happening there what we need from a story i did my research in terms of stills and this and that and uh, a lot of the script was written at night time which means shooting in like these villages in maharashtra making them look like they are in jharkhand that same texture that we had to create and a lot of the shoot at night when you shoot at night your body is not your body wants to sleep you are generally yes. trained to work from 9 to 9 sleep at 11 wake up at 8 but we had uh, out of the 80 days we shot we had around 40 45 days we were shooting overnights so like 7 pm to 7 am you know yeah. so uh, and we shooting in long big fields and stuff like that so i mean there is no light there when you stand there without a film crew you would see that you don't see anything you can actually just see in moonlight but the camera cannot see in moonlight you have to create that moonlight you have to create the ambience to shoot and stuff like that so technically doing a lot of those nights back to back is not just physically mentally also and also technically challenging you know uh so that i think was the most challenging part Because your body sets up to a clock, then it resets to another clock. It's also technically challenging because half your crew is asleep by two, three a.m. They're like tired. They just want to go home. Uh, but you're the head of the department. You won't have to push your crew. You have to still be creatively at your best, like as you were at like one p.m. or like in the afternoon, for example. So that part is diff. That part is difficult. And also, like it was not like so. Jamtara did have decent money to shoot, but it's not like we had leisure of money, you know. So sometimes we had to use our brain to figure out how to execute this and the money you have, you know. Uh, so it's a balance of that. I think both of those things were the real challenge. Sometimes you also have a time constraint. Sometimes you have location. When you don't have a lot of money, like crazy amount of money to spill, you have to compress a lot of things in one day. So you have to be fast. But sometimes when you're fast, you can also do bad work. So, how to be fast and not do bad work and do, do keep doing your job the way you want it to, you know? Because people yeah. are going to watch it; they're not going to know all the things behind it. They're just going to judge it. So, for the work to be at the best, I think those are the challenges that um, that Jamtara put us in. While you were having like overnights, you must be having like an argument with your crew or. Uh, with director or many like your team mates right so how did you uh, like how did you tackle those how did you manage to keep the crew together keep your team together hey uh, at the end of the day um, at the end of the day any management like at the end of the day if i'm a cinematographer uh, i know the technicals i know the creative but it's also managing my crew because i'm the head of the crew so i at least have Say I have fifteen people on lights. I have four or five people assisting me, and I have a lot of the other assist, like people in the department, like art and all that behind me. So it's at least managing thirty to forty people who are depending on you for guidance. You know, uh, so you cannot have a lot of these feisty arguments. But yes, you can have creative conversations that can be that can have friction. You know, and it's okay. I mean, at the end of the day, everyone's doing their job for the better. So you have to. take it smartly you have to handle ego smartly sometimes someone will be getting irritated you can't just yell at them you know like you have to figure a way to explain it to them take them on the side that kind of thing so man management is a very important skill that a cinematographer needs to have because at least in india there is a labor for every small thing there's someone who's giving you chai on set there's someone who's picking up lights there is someone who's doing art there are so many people and at the end of the day since you're the dp you're very close to uh the hierarchy of a director the director depends on you to execute and the director sitting on the monitor or like he's talking to the actors so for the show for the set to run on time the cinematographer has to be the key uh part in the machine functioning now in that sense if you keep having arguments then it's not going to be the good thing so you have to prep properly so that everyone knows what you're doing the communication has to be throughout that okay this is what we're doing this is what time we're going to be doing at this is how we'll be doing it so when how and and what are you going to do so once that is sort of figured out half the job is done so everyone's not shocked on set like oh why are we doing this why are we doing that but on set there are always times when you do 
have to have an argument if in case people don't agree and if everybody agrees that it means that definitely bad work is happening you know not everybody has the same mind so 1000 people cannot agree to one creative choice and uh, but that's what you call a healthy creative discussion and as long as it's done in good spirit it's okay but there's no bad blood that needs to be there there's no arguments that you need to have you need to take it more in a very managerial way you know uh, so so there are so many uh, qualities that a cinematographer should have apart from technical and creative uh field of it yeah look so for example uh when there is a script of say 70 pages and someone who's making the budget of it so netflix asks a production uh why don't you quote how much money can you do this in so they account for the number of days that they will do it in every day means every labor member paid every technician paid now if they divide 70 if they divide it into 70 and if they feel 70 days is enough then they ask the cinematographer and the director and they say that no we cannot do it in 70 that means there's something wrong you know yeah. so at the end of the day those two people combined with the art director combined with the sound recorders these hods and the actors are responsible of finishing work in the time that's decided and to be yeah. able to do that and not compromise on work ultimately decides how much money you will make it in so it's all like a step by step hierarchical system that it works on so <coughs> you are the cog in the wheel that's the most important and if you become very slow mm. that means the producer spends a lot of money and uh, he will either not hire you next time or he will go in debt but yeah. if you are clear in the beginning that look these days i will take this much amount of time and these these scenes will take more time than these and you schedule it properly the budget is made properly and you follow that then you are a good technician but you are also a good managerial uh, technician So I think it's a balance of all these things and I think it's in every field you know it's not just cinematography these basic human skills are required to run a team so yeah so as we are talking about uh, jantara so as you said your car- cargo movie is going to uh, like release soon and there is one more movie coming in november so can you like uh, talk about them or your upcoming uh, projects Yeah so I was uh, actually uh, working in uh, LA for a few years uh, I had actually gone there when I was 22 years old uh, because I wanted to just like explore a little bit more work in the industry there learn from professionals there and stuff like that so I was there when Cargo's script was sent to me Cargo is a very unique film because it's one of those rare science fiction films that's based in a spaceship kind of a thing it has Vikrant Masi and Shweta Tripathi in it and is directed by Aarti Kadav it it's going to be on a um, prominent digital platform i cannot say it right now because i'm not allowed to uh, but it's going to be announced in the next coming month for sure i, I actually shot it a year before jamtara but uh, it's that kind of a film that goes through festivals and uh, it's more indie art house i don't i won't say art house actually it's not art house but it's more in the independent film uh, space so I mean it doesn't star Ranveer Singh and uh, Deepika you know like it doesn't star these big people for theatrical markets to just pick it up quickly but it's a good story and it, at the end of the day there is a lot of uniqueness to it in terms of the the technical aspect of it also like it's based in a spaceship there is indian mythology there's a lot of interesting things there there's a small teaser that's running on youtube so i think you'll get a good idea of that then but it's going to be out digitally very very soon so i think um the 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 concerned platform will market it well and hopefully people will see it like they saw jamtara and i am doing another series that's already been announced it's directed by nikhil advani uh for amazon prime it's called uh, mumbai diaries 2611 uh there's an announcement that went out in january i think you might find a small snippet in the amazon yearly catalog that they put out so that's coming out in november oh wow. that's about uh 2611 and stuff that happened during that time and stuff like that so as uh, we are talking about your project so uh, like as a cinematographer like what yeah. were the <laughs> biggest challenges you faced uh, in your uh, like uh, career see i started out very young like i was like 19 when i started out and i got out of wrestling was when i was like 21 22 so for someone to trust a 22 year old with the kind of work that i was looking for I think that was very difficult you know and I don't have like like I have a baby face in a way you know like I can't like and I when I, when I remember when I was 21 22 it was very difficult for me to convince people to hire me so that was very difficult uh, but I knew that my work is good so hopefully one opportunity will lead to another and it's just 
the, that kind of that period of struggle is always sensitive for everybody you know when they're beginning in the film industry or say any kind of industry you know i mean i'm just i'm assuming i'm like addressing to artists of different uh, fields and yeah the time when the first eye goes on your work that period of time is the most tricky for you and that's what it was for me too and i think once that happened once someone starts looking at the first piece of work then to get your second becomes a bit easier then your third becomes a bit easier but um, yeah but but to keep your hunger like it was when you weren't noticed i think that's the biggest challenge as you grow you know so i think that's what i always push myself to and it's one of the challenges and one of the things that i always make sure that is there you know like you treat every day as a first day on set so yeah so as we were talking uh, talking about like uh, what are the challenges you face mm-hmm. and uh, so when you meet a director so uh, like when you discuss the script so how it, how important is it for the cinematographer to know the script and how well uh, a cinematographer should should know the script i mean i think script is everything because the script is initially the screenwriter the director's vision and the producer's vision and whoever is paying for that say uh, a big studio or whatever that is the story that you need to tell and all of us like no matter who is on set the dp to the producer to the director we are all servants of the story you know so we want the story to be told in the best way possible so that people want to watch it so to know the story is the story is your bible the screenplay is your bible you have to read it thoroughly you have to know your characters you have to know who story is it you have to know how you're going to say it so it's extremely never 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 go in to meet the director without reading the script that's been sent to you it's crime it it could lead to a lot of sourness between y'all and people might not take you seriously because at the end of the day it is about that you know so i read it at least 3 times before i even go and meet the director because i want to be thorough with my thoughts on it i go over everything i want to do it's like you know when you it's like even in like like if you're working in a it company and you have a presentation you prepare it and you go you just don't land up there so every meeting that you do as an artist also needs to have prep that goes into it so that people understand and because the thing is for example if i don't know what i'm talking about and i'm going to come up with it on the day then i'm always going to be a lot in the middle like uh you know that kind of thing and you don't want people to be lost in those words you want people to understand what you want to say the fact that you understand the film script <clears throat> or a series script and the fact that you're the right person to tell it well you know so for that to happen you really need to prove that you know the story you understand the story as you talk about like uh, the set uh, the things uh, the cinematographer has to do and what are uh, like what are the uh, major roles of lighting and uh, lens and camera and different stuff so may i know what is your favorite equipments like the a list of your equipments what are the what it, what is your favorite camera what is your favorite lights what are the what are your favorite lens what are your favorite filters it again depends on project to project but i can tell you say project bears so for example in jamtara uh jamtara was going on netflix and we knew that we needed uh, to shoot 4k at least and at that point there were only there was only the red camera that was doing that so The, uh, so there are a couple of cameras in the market called the Red. Then there's Alexa, uh, which is from a German company called Arri, and then there is Sony. So you have to choose according to the project. So Netflix, there you you got the Red. Now I wanted to create this very textured, organic village look. So I wanted to use older lenses. I didn't want to use the newer lenses, which are very clean and sharp. You know, I wanted to use these lenses, which had their sort of it had their flaws in it. you know the lenses yeah. that were older so i used these lenses that were the lenses that were used in ddlj also for example yeah. that old lenses is what i used those lenses were also used on secret games by the way so there are these lenses called the hawk lenses and i wanted to have a very larger than life look to the village i didn't want it to look very like normally when we see villages in cinema it's very or simple and humble and documentary documentary like i wanted it to be a very grand looking classic image so there is this format called anamorphic that we chose to shoot it in because it adds that little bit of style in the image so that's how you go about choosing your camera your lenses and then you decide okay so what's the budget we have and what is the language that we're choosing to tell so we chose to not do a lot of crazy camera going here wire you know 
I didn't want to distract the audience with my work. But sometimes when like the actor is really thinking about something or he's emotional, you go into the character and stuff like that. So for that, you need various devices like the Steadicam or you're using a dolly. A dolly is something that you use to track in, track out. Depending upon every day, you sort of chalk out what the kind of technical resources you want to go for. Cargo again was shot on newer lenses because I wanted it to look like it had to have very science fictiony kind of a uh, not plastic but kind of a very sharp modern look, you know. So then you chose newer lenses that had very clean, very crisp kind of a look, you know. And um, and I shot another new series now, which is Bombay Diaries, where I wanted to look like Mumbai, that how I remember when it happened. So I again used these lenses that had a particular texture, but I used the Arri camera because. For me, I was shooting a lot outside on the streets of Bombay in like very low light, so I needed a camera that responds well to very less light. So you do a lot of camera tests and you figure out, okay, this is the one or this is the one, you know. As you started when, like, you started very young. You said like you started when you were eighteen, and so uh, who were the aspiring? Like, who were your uh, admirers? Whom? Sorry, whom do you admire? And who were? Uh, From whom do you got influence into cinematography? See, I I didn't know much when I was eighteen. You know, like I used to only watch some films here and there. I was not such a cinema buff then. But I started as I started studying it. I realized that okay, this the history of cinema is it's mind blowing. You know, there are so many people that have done such amazing work, and obviously we are obsessed with the West and the cinema that is in Europe, in America, and this and that. So your early influences always come from there. I mean, I used to watch the cinematographer who I am still blown away with. He's one of my favorites, and I think a lot of DPs will tell you this that Roger Deakins is one of their uh, one of the favorites. Uh, so he was like his work really inspired me. But as you grow, you see so many other artists. You know, like you suddenly realize that okay, that is something that's a very populist kind of a thing. That some it's, he's like Sachin, for example. Mm. You know, so Roger Deakins is equivalent to someone like a Sachin Tendulkar, who's like a legend. He does amazing work, and everyone admires his work. So, like every cricket fan is a Sachin fan, that kind of thing. Yeah. But then there are other people also. There are other people who are doing good work. There are some. There are some European DPs that you can follow. Then I've been also recently. I'm studying some older Indian DPs. Like there was this cinematographer called Subrata Mitra who worked with uh, Satyajit Ray. You know. so mm-hmm. there is him so there are there's such a wide range of names that i can tell you but uh, there are always these favorites who are like the sachins you know like everyone will tell you their names and then there are these in between us who's work you really appreciate but they're not very well known unfortunately so there are those so there are these american greats like um rodrigo prieto and roger deakins and stuff like that but the indian contemporaries for example Also, you you also learn from the people who are doing the work now. So there are a lot of DPs now, especially in India. Like earlier, there used to be this notion that you know foreign firang DP ko leke aate and foreigner DPs are good, but now it's become. I mean, the best work in India is literally being done by Indian DPs. We only get the second rate of the foreigners that come here and shoot. I mean, there are a lot of DPs nowadays. Like Swapna Sonavni is very good. Uh, there is a DP who shoots amazing work. Uh, his name is Mitesh Mitchandani. He's an Uri. So there are some some of these young DPs who I also really admire, uh, and then some of these uh, older Sachins as I, as I would say that every DP in India would admire, for example. Uh, yeah. But it's a gradual process, and sometimes you don't even know the name, and you watch something like right now I'm watching this Netflix series called Dark. It's a German series, and it's yeah. amazing. It's, I'm very inspired by it. I was seeing Mind Hunter before that, and uh, I was amazed by it. You know. I'm done with my questions. So, is there any closing comments like you you would want to like tell? Yeah, I think see for, for for me, it's very important to just discuss that I am talking about deep cinematography tips or whatever. Okay, but I'm also learning. I'm also like not like a big senior DP and all that in India, but I know that my work is contemporary and it stands uh, against any the work that you see globally, for example. And that's always the that's always what you want to do. But I also feel like what I've spoken about is more in a very general aspect. It's all about every artist. It's not just cinematography. Like you can try and work this out in photography also. You can do this for any kind of field. At the end of the day, craftsmanship and artistry is something that is part of your personality. 
and the way you hone it is very important because what it means to you is more important than what it means to other people so it's not just about having your work outside and you becoming popular and you know like i mean i understand that nowadays that is something that everyone focuses on and it's a great thing you know but i think a part of craftsmanship is how much you enjoy doing it and i think it's of utmost importance to enjoy what you're doing because otherwise there is no point to it because see a painter no or like think about a painter in the 1700s for example or like 1600s or like a writer whose book he knows that maybe it's only going to be known in the town because there's not much technology for him to go out or her to go out so they are practicing it because they want to do it and slowly yeah. now because the reach is becoming so easy where our work can i can just put the picture on instagram and a thousand people can see it sometimes yeah. even it happens to me i'm saying like humanly you we go for being noticed as a, a taste of success more than enjoying it and actually experiencing the craft so i think is very 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 important for every artist to enjoy the journey of artistry and craftsmanship and focus on the right things because i think at the end of the day fame will come and fame will go i think it it comes at least for 10 years or 15 years then it just goes away every popular cinematographer first of all not many people know cinematographers anyway but you also talk about like directors for example they always have an in term and an out term and age naturally forces them to go out so at the end of the day after that happens it is really important whether or how you make that art and what it is to you and how you experience it because that at the end of the day is what i personally felt i grown with the most you know i mean it's important to shoot car but like i was to be frustrated when cargo was shot and i was like why why is it not coming out you know but i realized like i enjoyed cargo the most of all the things because i was at my hungriest best and i was experimenting and uh, i mean i'm glad that it's coming out in 3 months and pe- like 2 months and people will see it but uh, the process of it is more important i think that's the only comment that i can say at the end is like the process is the most important and for you to enjoy the process is even more important everything else fame or not see some people will get fame and some people will never be known so but maybe you are not famous but maybe you are able to harness the joy out of artistry more than that person who's famous so you have to differentiate these two things and it's very important to do that uh wow. so so it's not about uh, others it's about you and your art and how you get your uh, satisfaction through your art yeah because i mean you see the 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 best artists are only doing it they're practicing the art itself they are not spending time in propagating themselves um and like overselling themselves and this and that you'll just be seeing them quietly working you see their work and then you will go and find the name out they are not trying their best to like put themselves out there uh because they are busy doing work they are busy in giving themselves joy out of practicing it improving out of it it's basically about grow so it's about human contentment and you trying to sort of reach a space where like um you are learning from yourself and that is at the end of the day everything because uh what is there for someone after he's won all these awards and after he's getting accolades it's just about self improving because that's one thing that he can or she can do anyway because they can be better than what they were two days back and for that they need to take effort for that that has to be relentless yeah so i think it's very important to uh not fight with yourself but just always be in constant comparison with your previous self and want to go one step ahead and i think that's all to it because you see like for example this roger deakins okay so he shot a bunch of great movies a bunch shawshank redemption fargo like a bunch of revolutionary road but he is almost 70 now maybe like in mid 70s i don't know his exact age but he's still improving himself from what he was a few years ago and i think that at the end of the day is artistry at, at at the core of it be it painting be it writing be it anything you know yeah so i think we are uh, done with the questions uh, and uh, thank you so much koshal for joining us and taking out your uh, time and like uh, coming on this absolutely and- i mean I-, i spoke so many things that i think i learned from myself uh, <laughs> talking about because sometimes a lot of things are like 
hidden within that just come out when you're talking about those things to other people so uh, thank you so much and thank you to the great pixel team to reaching out to me to do this thank you thank you so much kaushal thank you